Okay, I think uh, I think we're live. So um, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Roberts and I'm an Associate Director uh, in Frontiers Energy Practice. And we're really delighted today to be publishing our report uh, looking at the commercial framework to enable hydrogen blending into the existing gas grid. Uh, and I was really, really pleased to see the amount of interest we've had in this work, both in, in the UK and across Europe. Uh, I can see maybe 60 people and counting dialed into this, which is fantastic. So I'm um, really glad to see that level of interest. Um, so the, the, the study was commissioned uh, by Cadent um, as an NIA project and clearly linked to the high deploy project uh, at Kiel, which is looking at the technical issues around hydrogen blending. So um, we're hoping for a really interesting discussion today and we're uh, very grateful to representatives from uh, Cadent and Progressive Energy and Keele University, who will be on our Q&A panel later. So uh, for those of you who, who may not know about Frontier, we're, we're an economics consultancy and we have uh, over 250 economists working throughout Europe and beyond. Uh, and we have a number of different uh, sector specialities and, and cross-cutting economic disciplines, but energy sector expertise is, is one of our biggest uh, practice areas. Uh, and we've been um, really active in the discussion around the future of gas. So in the UK, we've worked for the CCC, for Bayes and other government departments, um, for network companies and um, various utilities, um, all, all looking at uh, various topics around the pathway uh, to net zero. Uh, and also across Europe, we've done a lot of work around uh, alternative fuels for transport, on policy instrument design, regulatory issues, and market reforms around hydrogen and low carbon gases. We've worked for the European Commission for industry groups and others. So of course, I'd encourage you to get in touch if you'd like to know more about what we do or if you want to speak to one of our experts. So uh, on to today. Um, first, we're gonna hear from Dr. Angela Needle, who is uh, Director of Strategy at Cayman Gas, and she's gonna give a short uh, introduction to the background for this work. And I'll then hand over to my colleagues, Lucy and Aurora, who will present uh, the findings and recommendations from our study. And we're hoping to have around 40 minutes, maybe even more for Q&A um, at the end. And we'll split that into two panels. So first, we'll have representatives from Progressive, Cadent and Keel for around 20 minutes for discussion around blending. Uh, and then we'll bring the Frontier team back onto the stage for the last uh, 20 minutes or so and uh, we'll take questions on the findings and recommendations uh, from our report. So um, throughout the session, you can log questions if you look at the panel on your right hand side. There's the normal chat function, but there's also a separate questions panel. So if you want to ask a question to either of those panels, um, please do type your question there in the question box. Um, you'll also be able to see questions from other audience members and you can click to upvote a question from someone else if you would particularly like to see that answered. And I'll use that to moderate the, um, the Q&A later on. So please write your questions as we go through. It helps me to see them flowing in real time. And obviously, if you'd like to give your name and who you represent when you ask your question, I can read that out. Just a few quick housekeeping points. So the webinar is being recorded, I think, and will be made available. And we also have uh, another session arranged uh, next week on the 30th. So if, if any of your colleagues would like to attend, um, please do forward it on to them. Uh, and I should finally just say the work just, uh, clearly has a, a, a GB focus. Um, I'm aware we have attendees uh, from across Europe listening in today, but we'll try to maintain the focus of the discussion and the Q&A on GB issues. So if you want to talk about the relevance of that for different uh, countries, please get in touch with us. Um, there are names on the front of the report you can contact. Uh, and finally, very quickly, just a quick thank you to the clients team at Frontier, so Lizzie and Becky. So this is a, a new uh, webinar platform for us and we're using it for the first time today and they've worked um, very hard to help get, get a set up this. I'm sure they'll be watching uh, nervously as I probably muck up the functionality, but here we go. So um, without further ado, um, Becky, if you could maybe pull up the first slide and I'll ask uh, Angie to uh, uh, give a, a bit of background to the project. Over to you, Angie. Hello, yeah, thanks, Matt. Really great um, to, to be here and to see you all today. And it, it, interestingly, I've just had a quick look down the list of attendees, you know, having 80 people on the call across 
a really broad spectrum actually it's just brilliant to see and uh, I recognize a few of you too so that's great um just a little bit about Caden before I talk about why we, why this piece of work is important so um Caden is one of the um, gas distribution networks and we deliver of our um, natural gas today to 11 million homes um, in the UK. You know, our job is to safely supply natural gas so that we can all keep warm uh, all the time. And, um, you know, we cover a large proportion of the UK. So in, in relation to our uh, plans around net zero, we're looking at what we can do to transition, if you like, the gas distribution networks that exist across the whole of the UK from being a fossil fuel delivery vehicle, if you like, to one that transport green gases and gets us to that net zero goal. Now, there's quite a lot of things to do here. And what I'm really pleased to say is that across the gas distribution networks, of which um, we are one, um, we've divvied up the puzzle, the jigsaw puzzle, if you like, for how to transition to uh, green gases amongst us. Um, we hold the jigsaw piece about blending, um, with support from uh, some of the other GDNs too, such as Northern Gas. And we are all very supportive of each other's research programmes, which again, divvy up that jigsaw puzzle into chunks that make the, the full um, picture, if you like, as how you can safely transition to things like hydrogen. So we're going to be talking about hydrogen specifically today when it comes to blending. But let me tell you a little bit about why I think hydrogen is important. And you can remove that slide if you, if you want to. Um, so today, only sort of a very small percentage, about 0.1% of hydrogen is allowed in the um, gas network. Um, and, and when we think about blending hydrogen to the gas network, there's an immediate opportunity available to us. So um, we've been doing the work at Kiel University, as some of you know, which has been looking at how you can blend up to 20% by volume hydrogen into the network. And we've been looking at the impact that has on appliances and, and, um, and devices used in the campus. And I'm sure um, Keel will talk about that um, a bit later if we have questions on it. But we're demonstrating that it has very little impact on consumers. So you can start to blend hydrogen today if there was hydrogen available. Um, that, that creates an immediate decarbonisation. So if there's 20% of hydrogen in, in the gas network, we'd save 6 million tonnes of CO2 um, without consumers having to change their behaviour. That's really important. And as you've seen with green electricity, and you can buy green electricity, you could add hydrogen to be able to buy green gases. So consumers can start to buy into the fact that they can buy green electricity and green gas. Um, the other thing why blending is important is that it stimulates demand for hydrogen. It creates a place for all the hydrogen to go, uh, a stable demand base. Because don't forget, hydrogen is not being produced at scale anywhere in the UK at the moment, outside of some transport projects, which are very important as well, by the way. Um, so we need to stimulate demand and having a place for that hydrogen to go is important, especially when you think about the stepping stone towards potential networks that could have 100% hydrogen in it. And when we're doing work across the spectrum on both small amounts of hydrogen and lots of hydrogen in our network from a safety perspective and also how it interacts with people in their homes um, uh, from both a safety and a, te a technical perspective. And we know, by the way, hydrogen isn't the only answer for heating people's homes in the future, but we do know in some circumstances, it's going to be very difficult to decarbonize every house without without an alternative fuel source uh, to electricity. So 20% um, blending is important and it's it will stimulate investment in hydrogen production and get that hydrogen economy going. I genuinely believe that the UK has a potential to be a hydrogen hub. We've got more wind power generation potential than pretty much any other nation, you know, we could be a net exporter of hydrogen if we really put our minds to it. So um, blending is a really key stepping stone. And we've been looking at the technical side of things. And what I'm really pleased about this report is it takes us to the commercial side of things. So how does blending work? How do we manage it in the network? How do we govern it and control it? How do we pay for it? What kinds of metering and those kinds of things are going to be needed? So I'm really pleased that we've worked with Frontier on this on this piece of work and it will add that another jigsaw piece into the puzzle 
So thanks for that, um, Matt. I'll hand back over to you so we can hear more from the Frontier team. Okay, thanks, Angie. Um, so at this point, I think I'm going to hand over to Lucy and Aurora, who've been uh, le leading uh, the study. Um, Lucy, without further ado, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm Lucy Grigoriandi. I would also like to say a big thank you to everyone for joining today. Uh, as Matt mentioned, Aurora Phillips and I will present the key conclusions from our study. I'll start the presentation by providing an overview of the context of our project and our objectives, and we will then move to um, our findings. Um, Angie provided earlier an introduction on the potential role of hydrogen and uh, why we've done this study. So we'll quickly reiterate um, some of the points um, here. The um, Committee on Climate Change has highlighted that low carbon hydrogen could play potentially a significant role in meeting the UK's net zero target. And hydrogen blending could uh, be a stepping stone uh, towards that transition for various reasons. Um, you know, we have some examples here, one of them being that it can actually support large scale hydrogen production by providing a reliable source of demand and revenue. It can provide learnings um, towards what could become a 100% hydrogen grid and create, um, raise awareness of hydrogen. And it can also immediately decarbonize some of the gas flowing through the grid. There are some technical questions relating to hydrogen blending that need to be taken forward by the industry. An important one, um, which is the high deploy, which the high deploy project is looking into, is the maximum blending cap that can be accommodated without changing the end user appliances. Uh, we understand that the high deploys are currently demonstrating that to be around 20% in, in volumes. So this is what we refer to in, in our report. But if, if these technical questions are answered and if blending is to take place, then the commercial arrangements will need to potentially change. And th so this was the aim of our, of our work. It was to identify what are those changes to the commercial arrangements and setting out a roadmap for the industry to deliver those changes. We looked at six areas of the commercial framework, which we set out at the bottom of this slide. So the connections regime, which is how to enable the connection of new production facilities, potentially alongside other gas entry connections and other sources of gas, the regime for dispatch and system operations, so how to ensure that injections of hydrogen um, into the grid are managed to ensure that the blending cap is not um, breached at any time or at any location, issues around network pricing, uh, whether those um, need to take into account hydrogen injections and if so, how, shrinkage regime might need to take into account the different properties of hydrogen, and the billing regime, which is how to, um, whether the, kind of the framework for billing uh, and customers need to change. Um, I should flag in relation to the um, billing framework that issues that relate to the calorific value and kind of the varying calorific value of low carbon gases such as hydrogen or kind of biomethane, these are not considered as part of our study. And the reason is because there's a different study by Cadent called future billing methodology that looks into those options. So we will not, um, so these are not covered by, by us here. Aurora um, was leading on issues relating to system operation and dispatch, and I was leading on, on the other elements. So throughout this presentation, each of us will be presenting the areas that we were uh, leading on. We've structured our work across three stages, which you can see at the top of this slide. So the first one was identifying the elements of the current commercial framework that would need to change or to be introduced to enable hydrogen blending. Second stage was identifying solution packages to address those issues and evaluating those solution packages against some criteria to provide recommended solutions. And the third stage of our work was developing a roadmap for the industry to implement um, those uh, recommendations. Uh, throughout this work, we've engaged with um, a large number of stakeholders. So we, we formed um, a functional group, which consisted of representatives from the gas networks and the wider industry stakeholders, which you can see at the first two boxes of, 
of the slides. Um, they provided very useful input um, throughout our work and they acted as a sounding board to our findings. We also engaged with Bayes and Ofgem who also provided very useful comments to our um, initial findings. So we would really, really like to thank everyone that has uh, contributed um, and kind of provided input to this, to this work. In the next few slides, um, I will go through um, the findings on the issues and the solutions for adapting the framework. Um, I'll start by um, giving you a sense of the, our framework for thinking about the issues and um, solutions. So when we were thinking about what are the changes that are required to enable hydrogen blending, we thought it's important to recognize that hydrogen blending is likely to only ever be a, tra a transitional solution. So this is illustrated in the gray box at the top where um, hydrogen blending is shown um, to be the kind of the, the, the gray box, which then leads to the yellow box, which is the long term net zero system, which could be uh, which could look very different to what the, um, um, the transitional period looks like. So for example, it could be 100 percent hydrogen or it could it could be an alternative system. Within the period of hydrogen blending, it is relevant to consider how the system can look and how it will evolve over time because different assumptions in relation to that can actually drive different options for changing the commercial framework. In the early days of hydrogen blending, which is shown in the beginning of the blue arrow um, here, um, we assume that the number and location of hydrogen producers are such that the blending cap will not be reached very often and in many locations. And this could be because uh, there are only a few producers mainly connected at the high pressure level, or you also have uh, producers connecting at the lower pressure tiers, but those are sufficiently dispersed such that the blending cap isn't reached very often and in a lot of locations. So under these circumstances, we find that there are not a lot of issues to actually resolve uh, in, in the current commercial framework. And we come on to, on, on to those in, in the next few slides. These circumstances could persist um, until you reach the long-term net zero system. For example, that could be um, the case um, if you have more producers connecting, but um, Sorry, please, um, whoever's changing the slides. Um, this could be because uh, you can have more producers connecting, but um, um, the, the, these continue to be sufficiently dispersed, so the blending cap is enriched a lot, or it could be because the, the length of the transitional period um, isn't very long. However, we recognize that um, there is a future alternative world, which is indicated in this uh, pink arrow, um, that might create more issues for the commercial framework. And to give you an example of this alternative world, if you have a larger number of connections at both the higher and the lower pressure tiers, and the blending cap is reached um, often, then you will have more questions about system operation and uh, managing hydrogen injections. You will also potentially have more questions about incentivizing the right location of, of connections. Um, so um, these, these issues might um, create more issues um, uh, for, for the commercial framework. And um, again, we will, we will come on to talk about, um, about our thoughts um, in relation to that in a bit. Um, it is important to keep in mind that there is a large degree of uncertainty in relation to this transitional stage of hydrogen blending. So we don't know how long uh, the transition will last. We don't know whether we will move to the pink arrow stage. We don't know what is the long-term net zero system. So given this uncertainty, um, our recommendation in the report is that it's not sensible to instigate a large number of very complicated changes to the commercial framework that will only work in some limited circumstances that might not materialize in the future. So when we've thought about issues and recommendations on the amendments to the commercial framework, we've taken a low regrets approach and we focused on addressing the issues that arise under 
the baseline circumstances, the, the blue the, the blue arrow. And when we've done so, we've taken into account path dependency considerations. So we have reflected in our analysis whether those changes um, uh, create uh, any barriers for potentially introducing uh, more complicated changes to the framework if more complicated circumstances arise. So this is something that uh, we, we kind of take into account when we are recommending our, um, our solutions. Um, on the next slide, we will talk through these issues and our recommended solutions. I'll hand over to Aurora to go through system operation and dispatch. Thank you, Lucy, and hi, everyone. Um, so as Lucy mentioned, the first stage of our work involved thinking about what types of issues might arise under the current commercial framework if hydrogen blending is introduced. Um, and what we found was that only a very limited number of issues actually need to be resolved under the baseline circumstances. Um, we've grouped these issues together where common solutions can be found. So the first group of issues which I'll talk to uh, are related to connections, dispatch and system operation. The first issue you can see on this slide is how should the blend limit, uh, how should the blend be kept below the hydrogen blending cap? And this arises because it's essential for safety reasons that the blend limit is not breached at any location on the grid. Um, obviously, currently gas is fairly uniform, so there's no mechanism around monitoring blend or managing dispatch to control the level of that blend. Um, whereas in a world with hydrogen blending, we need a clear and robust approach to managing the gas blend, um, as well as clarity around where responsibilities for managing the blend lie. The second issue is um, how capacity is allocated. So the amount of hydrogen that can be injected at any given entry point will be limited by a combination of two factors. The first is the volume of gas flowing past that entry point. Um, and the second is what percentage of that gas is already made up of hydrogen. So you can imagine um, that a hydrogen producer might connect at a given point on the grid, um, and there might be a large volume of methane flowing past that entry point. So that producer would expect to be able to inject hydrogen, making up 20% of the volume of that gas. However, it could be that in future, another hydrogen producer connects upstream of the original producer injects up to 20% and then prevents the downstream producer from injecting any further hydrogen. So the commercial framework needs to think about these types of issues, set out how hydrogen capacity is allocated to producers, and also set out which producers will be curtailed when the blend limit is reached. The final issue we have is um, how to manage specific requirements of large users. Um, so hydrogen blending will impact certain characteristics of gas quality received by users. Um, and so it could, it could impact the efficiency of industrial equipment and other processes. So there will need to be some type of mechanism in place to manage those impacts. Um, for each group of issues that we've identified, we've also thought about potential solutions uh, under the baseline circumstances. Uh, we've evaluated those and then we've set out a recommended solution. Um, and as part of our evaluation process, we've also considered what types of solutions could be needed further out in the future when the, when the baseline circumstances no longer apply. Um, and we've used that in our evaluation to make sure that our recommended near-term solution doesn't close any doors if a, if a different solution is needed in future. So for system operation, dispatch and connections, our recommended solution has two main elements, uh, which is set out here. So the first is an impact evaluation, which would be when a prospective hydrogen producer applies to connect to the grid, the relevant network operator, whether that's national grid or one of the GDNs, uh, would lead an impact evaluation before providing connection terms to that producer. Um, the evaluation would look at the impact that the producer would likely have on other hydrogen producers. So in particular, whether it might limit the ability of other producers to inject, um, as well as on users with specific requirements, such as industrial users. Uh, if the impact is found to be material, then the operator would work with the producer to find an alternative and more suitable location for the connection. Though it's worth remembering that all of this is under baseline circumstances, so we would expect most impact evaluations wouldn't find any material impact. Uh, the evaluation process would also require GDNs and National Grid to work together quite closely, 
um, and to share information and data. Uh, and that's in order to be able to assess the whole system impact of any connections. So for example, if a producer wants to connect at the transmission level, it could impact other producers at the distribution level. The second element of the solution package uh, is that hydrogen producers would be subject to constraints on their ability to inject gas into the grid. Uh, the main constraint would be what we call an injection blend constraint. And that would mean that any gas injected must not cause the immediate locality of the entry point uh, to breach the hydrogen blend limit. Um, the system operator or relevant GDN would act as a safety backstop, so they would monitor the blend level across the network and would curtail any producer if they breach the requirement. And there could also be other constraints, uh, for example, on gas quality, and that would help manage the impact on industrial users and other users with specific requirements. Um, we've also considered some more complex approaches to managing the blend limit, uh, such as a last in first out approach, um, where when the blend limit is reached, the producer that was last connected would be the first to be constrained. Um, but we found that a lot of these approaches create a disproportionate cost and complexity under the baseline circumstances. So in the near term, we think that this recommended solution strikes a good balance um, and uh, sets out a good amount of uh, sort of complexity in relation to dealing with the issues. I'll hand back to Lucy to speak about network pricing. Thanks, Aurora. Um, another set of issues that uh, we've identified relate to network prices and connection charges. So those are issues two and three that you can see there. Um, we've considered whether the current framework for transmission and distribution charges, both in terms of network prices and connection charges will continue to ensure cost reflectivity and facilitate effective competition in a hydrogen blended system. Uh, and one reason to consider this is because in a hydrogen blended system, you will have a larger number of connections, potentially, um, you know, both hydrogen and the kind of ongoing development of biomethane who would be connecting at both the distribution and the transmission level. So this looks a little bit different to the traditional system that the current framework has been predominantly designed for, where you have a smaller number of producers mainly connected at the transmission system. Another reason why to, con to consider the, the, um, the properties of the, of the charges in, in this world is because in a blended system, um, you will have hydrogen, um, and methane and by methane and hydrogen has a lower calorific value than methane uh, which means that for a given level of demand of energy um, you will need a larger hydrogen volume to to deliver that so if the network becomes more capacity constrained as a result of those calorific value differences then it is relevant to consider whether the existing framework remains cost reflective given these differences in calorific values um, i was first start um, discussing our recommendations for transmission charges and we will then move to the distribution charges in the next slide. Um, in relation to transmission charges, we looked at a number of options with, which had different pros and cons. You can see those in, in our report. Uh, but we event eventually concluded that we do not recommend a change to the existing arrangements. So the current arrangements include a shallow connection boundary at entry, which means that the cost of the connection charge recovers the cost of the extension assets and does not recover any deep reinforcement cost to the network as a result of the user's connection. And it also includes a postage stamp regime, which means that there is a single price for entry and exit capacity across locations. Um, although we do recognize that um, this is a reserve price. So if an entry connection results in a significant reinforcement cost, then the entry price may actually be higher than the posted stamp reserve price to reflect that. Ofgem recently looked into the transmission charges and implemented the postage stamp regime. And uh, on the base of our assessment, we do not think that hydrogen blending is likely to change that assessment. Um, so on that basis, we recommend um, no, no change for the transmission charges. Um, for distribution charges, we recommend a change there. 
the current distribution charging framework was designed for a system where gas entered predominantly from the NTS. There were some changes that were made in 2013. You might, some of you might be aware that um, the LDZ system entry commodity charge was introduced then, which had um, the aim of reflecting more accurately the cost associated with bimethane connections directly to the distribution grid. Um, but uh, we've uh, con considered the charges again because we think hydrogen blending will result in a larger number of distribution entry connections and it's relevant to consider whether those arrangements are, st are still appropriate. Uh, we recommend um, two changes. Um, the first, is, uh, first change is replacing this system and en entry commodity charge element with a long run marginal cost based entry capacity charge that is applied to entry injections at the distribution grid. Um, we think this will um, create some efficiency benefits be because it will send some forward looking cost signals in relation to network investment to new injections directly connected at the distribution level. And we also suggest adjusting the connection boundary from a deep connection boundary, which is currently to a shallow connection boundary to avoid sending some locational signals twice and also um, potentially help with um, facilitating um, entry connections at the distribution grid. Both those changes we think will bring some efficiency benefits, but the scale of those will depend on the number of distribution connections um, that um, you're likely to have. So really the test there is um, comparing those efficiency benefits with the costs um, that come with the effort and time to implement those changes. So we think the, the industry is going to be better placed to, to make um, a final decision on that once more information becomes available on, on the scale of distribution connections. Both um, issue two and three looks at um, the distribution and transmission charges in isolation. Um, what we do in issue four is looking at the charges at the transmission distribution level as a whole. So considering whether the methodology and rules um, for setting the network charges create a level playing field between entry connections at the transmission and entry connections at the distribution level, as well as between entry connections across the, the different gas distribution networks. We've uh, identified two issues in relation to ensuring a level playing field. One is that at the moment there isn't a common charging methodology for entry connections across the gas distribution networks. So for example, there isn't a common methodology for uh, estimating the charges or uh, in relation to the ownership of the entry equipment. And the second issue relates to um, an inconsistent connection charging boundary between the distribution and the transmission network. So, so as I've said, the transmission networks has a shallow connection boundary, which means that the charge recovers the cost of the extension assets only for distribution. Uh, the charge recovers the cost of the extension assets plus some um, share of the deep reinforcement costs that are required to enable that connection. So the boundary isn't consistent. Um, in terms of our recommendations, so we recommend a common charging methodology because we find that this will facilitate effective competition between network users connected at different networks. We do note that this um, change will take some time and effort, so it, so it should be tested once more information becomes available um, on the scale of the distribution uh, connections to the distribution entry connections. Um, and uh, in relation to the connection boundary and the consistency, um, it follows from our recommendations in relation to distribution and transmission charges that um, a shallow connection boundary will be ensured because we, assume we recommend no change to the shallow connection boundary for transmission. And we recommend a change from the deep connection boundary to a shallow connection boundary for distribution so that um, issue disappears if, if, if one was to apply our recommendations two and uh, three. So those are the areas where we recommend a change under the baseline circumstances. You will have noticed that we haven't recommended any change in relation to the billing and the 
shrinkage framework. For billing, the reason is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, that um, this area of work is uh, is covered by the future billing methodology by Cadent. We haven't identified any other issues in relation to billing, billing that need to be taken forward, so we don't um, consider options in relation to that, but we do note uh, what the industry needs to do to drive this forward in a roadmap. And for shrinkage, uh, we think further testing um, is required to understand whether the hydrogen blending will mater materially alter shrinkage rates. And depending on that, that will drive different options and uh, questions about whether the shrinkage measurement and factors need to be need to be adjusted. So that needs to happen once more clarity, um, once there's more clarity in relation to that technical question. I'll hand over to Aurora to go through uh, a roadmap. I should stay uh, I should say that uh, we, we, we're nearly there. I think we are running on time. So I think we'll have another 10 minutes on our presentation and then we will do the Q&A. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so we've now given a very quick summary of the issues and challenges that could arise under the current gas commercial framework and our recommended solutions. Um, and the final and possibly most important part of our work um, has been setting out a roadmap for the gas industry to undertake the changes needed to enable hydrogen blending. Some of those changes relate to implementing the solutions to the challenges we've set out and others are more general changes that would need to happen to allow hydrogen onto the grid. So we've structured the roadmap in two stages, what we've called preparation and standardization. The preparation stage uh, focuses on allowing the first few hydrogen producers to connect to the network. Um, so at this point, treatment can be quite bespoke. So there's less focus on establishing frameworks and more focus on implementing changes that are absolutely necessary to get hydrogen onto the grid. Um, so for example, establishing a hydrogen support policy and amending regulations. Um, you can see the timeline we've set out there is um, starting as, as soon as possible really and going up to what we've called day one which is when the very first producers will connect. The next stage um, is around setting up a more permanent and standardized framework um, and uh, essentially putting in place um, frameworks that can apply to a large number of hydrogen connections um, and which will be more enduring. Um, and the timeline for this stage um, some of these actions can happen in parallel to the preparation stage, whereas others may need to build on learnings and inputs from some of the preparation stage actions, um, so may need to happen after the preparation stage. Uh, so you can see here that the timeline goes up to day N, uh, which is when a standardized framework would be in place. Um, all of this, again, is under baseline circumstances, uh, but once a standardized framework is in place, we expect that industry-driven code and license modification processes could be used uh, to allow the framework to evolve in line with how hydrogen blending develops. Um, so we expect that to be quite a natural process once the initial standardized framework is in place. Um, over the next few slides, we'll talk through um, some of the preparation stage actions at a very high level. There's obviously a lot more detail on this in our report, but this should hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of what we think needs to be done to enable hydrogen blending. Um, you can see that in the roadmap, we've considered a few things. We've thought about how long each of the actions will take. Um, we've thought about dependencies between actions, so where outputs from one action need to lead, need to feed into another and that's shown in the arrows you can see between some of the actions. Um, and we've also thought about who might be the main group that could lead these actions. So that's shown in the color coding where purple is government, blue is off-gem or networks, and yellow is networks or the wider industry. Um, it's also worth saying that in the top row, you can see that we've set out uh, the timelines for the first few hydrogen investors that will be looking to connect on the grid. Um, and we've set out their final investment decision, uh, the building phase for those initial plants, and then the commissioning of those plants. And this is particularly important because to get hydrogen blending off the ground in the next few years, we need to make sure that the commercial framework doesn't act as a barrier to those first investors. Uh, so a lot of the timings at the preparation stage are driven by what progress those initial investors will need to see in order to be able to make a final investment decision. 
Um, so the first group of actions you can see here are overarching. They aren't linked to any specific area of the commercial framework. Um, the first one is uh, for Bayes to develop a hydrogen support policy and conclude initial support contracts. That obviously needs to be done before any investors can make their final investment decision. Actions two and three are around reviewing licenses and uh, the uniform network code and making any adjustments or exemptions that are needed to get hydrogen onto the grid. Um, action number four is around collecting evidence on restrictions for initial connections. Um, so again, because at this point we are looking at quite bespoke treatment, um, there isn't a robust mechanism in place yet for dealing with uh, hydrogen blend. Um, so networks will need to establish where producers can connect uh, such that they won't impact international flows or um, large users that may have specific requirements. Um, once that's been done, uh, that can feed into initial stakeholder engagement and signposting. So networks will need to communicate with uh, initial investors, set out what those initial restrictions are and how uh, those restrictions are likely to be lifted over time. Um, and the final uh, step here is applying for GSMR uh, amendments and exemptions, again, to get hydrogen onto the grid. Uh, the next group of actions is around system operation, dispatch and connections. Um, so action number seven is an important learning that has come out of the process with biomethane plants, uh, where it took quite a long time for networks and producers to agree uh, on entry point ownership boundaries and responsibilities. So who would own and operate what equipment at the entry points. So this is something we think that uh, networks need to start on quite early and uh, consult fairly extensively with, um, with producers and other stakeholders. After that's done, networks can draft bespoke connection agreements for those first producers. Um, and then steps nine and 10 are around developing and installing entry point and blend monitoring equipment, uh, which needs to be in place before the first plants come online. Lucy, I'll hand back over to you. Great. Um, in relation to billing. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> Um, in, in relation to billing, um, there are four more actions uh, that we've identified. Firstly, we think a working group will need to be established to uh, develop some future billing methodology options, um, particularly that involves reviewing the outcomes of the future billing methodology study and providing some advice on the way forward, including whether there are any gaps in the current studies that need to be considered further. Once the networks have agreed on the billing methodology options and the appropriate way forward, Ofgem will need to review this, determine an appropriate way forward and set out what are the changes that are required to the regulations to implement these. At the moment, to change the billing framework, specifically the methodology for calculating the calorific value for billing purposes, um, this requires uh, amending um, the gas thermal energy regulations. Um, we note in our report that the process for amending the billing regime could actually be much more simplified if the methodology for calculating the cal calorific value for billing purposes was removed from the scope of government regulations and was instead incorporated into the UNC or other off-term regulations. But in, in, in either case, there will need to be some, some change to the, either the gas thermal regulations or if those are moved to off-term regulations, to the off-term regulations. And then lastly, Exoserve is likely to need to make some changes to their system. The next stage of a roadmap is the standardization stage. This stage is focused on reducing the restrictions and standardizing the treatment of future hydrogen producers connecting to the grid. So this is where a lot of our recommended solution packages will be implemented. Um, this is, um, there are opportunities at this stage to also achieve some common uh, approaches with biomethane, which will be important in order to ensure that there are common rules across different sources of ga gas where they, where they need to be. Um, there are some overarching actions that uh, need to happen at this stage. Firstly, uh, it will be important to build on the learnings from the experiences with the first few hydrogen producers. So that could involve, for example, testing the robustness of the baseline assumption, 
and consider whether further changes to the commercial framework are needed. Um, uh, it will also be the stage uh, where um, the industry makes changes to the licenses, codes and agreements in order to establish the more comprehensive framework for hydrogen blending. Uh, and lastly, um, you would need potentially to refine the hydrogen support policy and ensure that it works in harmony with the commercial framework. In relation to system operation and dispatch, the key will be to reduce the restrictions that are imposed under the preparation stage and implement a standardized treatment and the recommended solutions that Aurora talked to in, in the earlier slide. Network pricing, the actions that we've identified there are setting out what needs to happen to implement our recommended solution packages for distribution charges and what Exoserve um, needs to do following that. And we've also identified an action in relation to shrinkage. So we think that's where it's relevant to further test uh, uh, whether hydrogen blending will mater materially change the shrinkage rate and to identify whether any other changes to the commercial framework might be required. These points are reflected in the detailed timeline that we show on this slide. I'm not going to go through the detail um, of this, as this is a lot, but uh, we we explain every action in, in the report. So um, if you have any questions, you can always get in touch with us um, after. Aurora, should I hand over to you now? Yes, thanks, Lucy. Um, so we're nearly there. Uh, before we wrap up, I'll just touch briefly on uh, what we think that Bayes and Ofgem could do to enable industry to start work on the roadmap in good time. Uh, so firstly, we would recommend that Bayes provides uh, a signal with cre clear direction to industry um, that hydrogen blending uh, in the grid is part of the route to net zero um, and set out some expected timelines by when Bayes would hope that the first few uh, hydrogen producers might uh, be injecting into the grid. Um, following that, Bayes could form uh, a delivery group uh, which would oversee and coordinate the actions on the roadmap and that could then be taken forward by Ofgem uh, and that would make sure that everything runs to time and that responsibilities are clearly set out. Um, following that, Bayes could also provide uh, some more specific direction to Ofgem, uh, for example, by setting hydrogen blending as a key priority for Ofgem's strategic innovation fund, uh, which Ofgem is introducing as part of Rio2. Uh, Ofgem can then take that forward and identify other tools in the regulatory framework that might help enable hydrogen blending and make sure that those are being used. We would then expect that the industry can uh, make a coordinated and timely start on the actions set out in the roadmap and make sure that the commercial framework for hydrogen blending is ready when it's needed. So I think that's everything we have in terms of slides. Um, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Matt to lead the Q&A sessions. Uh, thank you, uh, Rora and Lucy. Um, We've had uh, an awful lot of questions coming in. Very grateful for that. There's clearly a lot of engagement on this. Uh, so I'm going to um, just give a quick introduction um, to our, our first panel. So um, we have uh, Angie Needle, who we heard from earlier, who is uh, Director of Strategy at Cadent, uh, who will be joined by Stuart Easterbrook, who is um, the Future Gas Strategy Manager at Cadent and has been one of the lead sponsors of, of our study. Uh, and we've also got uh, Tommy Isaac, who is a principal engineer at Progressive Energy, part of the Hydroploy project, uh, and Professor Zoe Robinson from Keele University, who has uh, undertaken social science research into public, public perceptions of hydrogen uh, amongst the Keele campus uh, community. So I'm going to um, quickly invite them to the stage. Uh, Stuart, I'm not sure this is working for you, so you may be able to invite yourself onto the stage if that's possible.
Hi, Tommy, Stuart, and we're just waiting for Zoe to join. Um, while we're waiting for Zoe, so um, I should say, obviously, a number of the questions are sort of fairly technical in nature, and we'll try and address as many of those as possible in this first se panel session. Um, there are a number of questions that are more related to the commercial framework and our study, so I will um, put those on hold and, and we'll answer those in, in the second panel. Um, so th thank you, um, Tommy, Stuart, Angie and Zoe for joining us. Um, I wonder if I might just um, briefly, before we dive into some specific questions, um, just maybe ask Zoe if you could say a few words about the work that you've been doing at Keel. Yeah, OK, thank, thanks for that. And um, really, I, I've been looking at this um, th this work and uh, the, the high deploy project from, from a different uh, angle, from really trying to understand the consumer perspective. And that's really important because because actually we need to ensure that we get the public narrative right for, for this energy transition. So all, everything else, obviously really crucial, but that public narrative is important. So um, the Keele University trial um, as part of the High Deploy project has given us the first opportunity to, to understand um, what people think about having hydrogen in, in their home from people who are actually about to, to have it done um, to them. So we had 100, 100 domestic properties on the high deploy network at Keele and we went for a qualitative approach. So 16 deep interviews with a wide cross section of our residents on campus. Um, before the, the blending started. And we actually have a second stage of research to do um, sort of later on into the, the winter period. Um, and this was really to try and understand a bit about people's perceptions of hydrogen, what they feel about being part of the, the trial. And, and in order also to really understand um, what sort of communication approaches um, help um, in order for us to sort of help create that, that narrative. Um, and, and like previous um, sort of studies of, of just sort of the general public, you know, two things that really do come up with, with hydrogen are, are firstly, there is still a public association with sort of hydrogen and, and explosions, and that needs to be considered and, and dealt with in terms of the narrative. And also, you know, feeding into this idea around sort of billing is, um, is those concerns about what this means in terms of, of cost. Um, but, but overall, actually, what, what we've, we found is a, very, um, a, a lot of support for, for the, the project for hydrogen um, being used in this way because of the, the immediate um, you know, carbon reductions with, with no effort. OK, um, thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, and Tommy, maybe if I could just pass to you to just say a few words about the work you've been doing. Sure. So um, good to be with you today. So um, my work on hydrogen uh, on the um, Hydropoint program is part of the overall project management team here at Progressive. Um, so uh, most specifically, we focus on the evidence base that's required to justify the safety case for the trials, the engineering that goes into actually delivering it, and then all of the um, commercial models that allow us to actually deliver the trial within the current um, um, being mechanisms of Keel. So that's a kind of one-liner. Happy to go into any more if people have questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I think um, uh, Stuart. Obviously, we've obviously we've already had an introduction from Cadence. So I think what I'll do now is just dive straight into some of the questions that have been asked. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of questions, and um, I doubt we're going to have time to get through all of them. So we have to wrap this up by um, like forty to move on to the frontier. To, to the next panel. Uh, so I'm just going to ask the first one, which I think is the one that has been up, upvoted the most, which is from uh, Robert Dent, uh, who asks, um, what percentage of the current gas infrastructure is suitable for 20% hydrogen blend? Um, Stuart, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Matt. And uh, just, just a quick point. Now, one, of, one of the benefits of, of commissioning this report is, is to enable this wider debate. Um, as a sector, we're very used to looking at technical questions, engineering questions, but there are lots of commercial and regulatory ones which um, this report helps helps the sector start start to engage and think about those. And a healthy list of questions shows that uh, that's uh, that's kicked off. Um, 
in terms of the question about the current infrastructure, um, I mean, that's really the sort of the heart of the high deploy project. Um, it is about building that evidence case so that we can demonstrate that the existing network can take up to whatever the number is, say 20% of hydrogen blending without having to do any changes to the assets. So the works, um, uh, phase one has been run through with Kiel. Um, phase two up in the Northeast is currently um, under development. Um, and there may also be a phase three. So the, the idea is the end of that, we'll have a big tick in the safety box to say, right, safety, technically, we can put up to 20% into the existing assets without having to change them. Um, and that includes the gas network assets, uh, the meters can cope with it, but also the, the appliances in people's homes can also cope with it. Um, there's a question around metering as well. So physically, we think the meters are should be okay for it, and I deploy will, will give the evidence for that. Um, billing itself is is one of the big areas which I think is alluded to in uh, or covered in the report earlier that um, we know we need to do something to fix the billing regime um, and uh, the future billing methodology is a separate project which will help inform that and is due to finish um, later in 2021. So we should be able to start drawing some conclusions from that and try to identify a hopefully a simple non-complex change to the billing regime. Um, and if we can make the billing regime itself more um, flexible in terms of governance, because currently it's in sort of control of, of government legislation, if we can make that more flexible, then that would make that step even easier as well. Thanks, Stuart. I wonder, I mean, we've obviously gone on to the, the, the billing question and the sort of the customer impact. There's obviously a lot of technical is issues around what to do around the flow weighted calculation, et cetera. But Zoe, I wonder if maybe you could say a little bit more just about the sort of consumer um, uh, the consumer issue, uh, consumer impact. So, I mean, what what did you find were the biggest issues with residents at Kiel when when converting to the blend? Yeah. So, so I suppose in terms of the the initial concerns um, that people sort of expressed as as having, and you know, I think it's 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 important to say you know these are changes which are being made to people's houses. Um, you know, those things. It's their families live in them. Um, it's obviously a technology that people don't have the option of, of opting out of. So it's really important that we do sort of listen to, to those areas of, of concern that sort of come out. Um, and as, as I said, you know, really the, the sort of two key areas were um, initially obviously sort of safety and and we you know we know you know it, it, that it's it's as safe as gas. That that's where, what the uh, the HSE exemption sort of demonstrated. But we've still got to acknowledge that people are making those associations, and also um, you know, the, the concerns are around sort of cost. So it's like yeah, we we love the fact that it's um, you know it's having good environmental impact and and it's there's no disruption, um, but we don't ha want to have to pay more for it. And I think, you know, there's been a bit of a sort of narrative, um, you know, over the, the years about sort of customers sort of paying for um, for these for, for the green tr transition. Um, and so that is a first area of sort of concern for, for people. And I think it's really important that um, issues around billing are, are sort of um, dealt with, are are sort of made sort of public early on in that narrative because it's if it if it's not then it's certainly something which might start to, to create some resistance if people think that it's going to have a negative impact on them um further down the line so so i think you know overall um you know support for hydrogen and and people um you know we're, we're really responsive to a strong environmental message but they don't want to to be sort of negatively affected um but at the same time I don't think we should always assume that people are driven entirely by by cost and actually um, the messaging around that that really sort of the, the positive environmental messaging um, is is important as long as we get the cost right. Okay, thank you. Um, Tommy, I wonder if we might come to you now um, and, and maybe touch on some of the, the sort of more technical questions around hydrogen blending uh, that have been in the chat. Um, so there was one early on, I think, came from Will Steggles. So um, what, what would be the cost um, per tonne of CO2 um, from, from uh, to save six megatons of CO2 from blending 20% hydrogen? So uh, very good question. Um, so the, the, the 
Um, the purpose of, of lending 20% is that the current infrastructure can take it. So if you, if you, if you assume that that is a assumption that can be evidenced to its fullest extent, then the cost is solely a function of the um, supply um, because it would just be put into the current network and appliances. Um, so it's, it's really a question of how do you produce it. Um, so the, the cheapest form of producing hydrogen is through blue hydrogen, um, as it's known, so autothermal reforming with CCS. Um, this is a technology that can produce bulk hydrogen and capture around 97% of the carbon for around 40 pounds a megawatt hour um, at base production. If you then try and concatenate that with some distribution, then you're looking at um, sub 100 pounds a tonne um, as an abatement cost. So um, even the first um, sort of initial deployment should be within the um, bracket that we would consider that, um, acceptable. So particularly if you look at um, marginal abatement curves um, issued by the Treasury to prioritise decarbonisation technologies. Um, now, the other forms of production, primarily electrolysis, are slightly behind that curve, um, but clearly they've got um, a uh, you know, they've got their technology curve to work down. That's more like 160 pounds a megawatt hour, um, but that's based on smaller scale um, projects that are currently deliverable. I'm sure with I'm sure over time that will work down. So at so at the moment, bulk hydrogen can be delivered for around 100 pounds a megawatt hour, um, sorry, uh, around 100 pounds a tonne, um, but, but likely to be slightly cheaper. Okay. And, and the, the, the sort of, there's another question, I think, from Mark Redway. So in terms of total mass, how many tonnes of, of hydrogen would a 20% would a blend require approximately? Is that something we can answer? Uh, that's a lot of um, mass in my head on the spot, but um, <laughs> uh, it, it's, it, so, natural gas is around 900 terawatt hours a year circa um and a 20 percent blend is 6.5 percent um so um yeah if you convert that to tonnage it's it's around 5,000 tons a day it should be that's impressive maths in your head on the spot <laughs> yeah, well, i might be out by zero but i'll i will i will check but it should be around 5,000 tons a day sure um, okay, so I'm going to move to a question that came from uh, Adam Beardmore, um, and I think this was upvoted quite a bit, um, this one. So um, his question was, with hydrogen carrying um, a third of the energy density of gas, um, how do you see seasonal swings in demand being managed for domestic heating, and will increased storage capacity be required in the UK? Um, Who's best place to answer that? Shall, shall I give a start and then yeah. others can chip in? So um, it, it kind of depends on uh, how much hydrogen we need and what we need it for. Um, so, I mean, there is a future that is becoming more certain that there's going to be a blend of different technologies needed to decarbonise people's homes. Um, and a large proportion of that could be hybrid heating systems. So heat pumps that then require additional gas in the winter to support them. Now, if you're just needing that gas for the winter months and you can have a different solution for the rest of the year, you really do need a storage solution, not only for heating those homes with a secure supply, but also a place for re renewable hydrogen to go, green hydrogen, whilst it's being produced potentially all year round. Um, so I think for both those re reasons, there's going to need to be significantly more storage than there is today. Um, I, was, I was just going to add to that that I mean, ultimately it will, for hydrogen blending, it will depend on where where the connection is. So if you connect at a high pressure tier, um, it's unlikely even in off peak that you would be constrained by the twenty percent blend. But as you move down through the pressure tiers, then a large hydrogen project may not be able to get all its output onto the network um, and not breach that twenty percent. So the economic could then come into play in terms of of how it would run. Would it shut down? Would it need storage? Um, or alternatively, would it find another another um, another route to market? So if, if it could have a filling station, for example, where 
um, it could it could use some of that hydrogen that it couldn't get into the network in the summer, but use it for refueling. Okay, thank you. I think that's I think that's a good comprehensive answer to that, to that question. Um, Shall we move to, um, there was a question from Paul Hallis, which was about sort of distinguishing between the transmission and distribution here. So he asks, is transmission blending likely to be more difficult and more restricted in terms of H2 blend percent than distribution blending? Um, thinking in particular of connected facilities, so compressors, power stations, gas storage facilities. I think there was another question as well from Adam at Centrica about um, how do you see blending's impact on compression stations throughout the networks? So maybe we could address both of those. Sure. Do you want me to give it a crack? Yeah, thanks, Tommy. Um, so in the the key difference between um, transmission and distribution is simply the pressures that they operate um, at. Most most other equipment is, is by and large very similar, just a different size. Um, so the key question with regard to any technical challenges comes to the material implications of the blend. Um, so there's work going on by uh, um, by Grid um, High NTS, which is trying to dig away at those problems, or, or at least try to map them um, for the materials on the um, on the high pressure system. Although the advantage of the high pressure system is that um, uh, the materials are generally slightly higher spec um, and and they are known to a greater extent than, than the materials on the low pressure side, particularly um, down, at, um, down at the distribution scale. Um, regarding assets like compressions um, uh, or um, decompression stations and heating stations, um, there's no evidence yet that there should be an issue. But, that, but we haven't got a comprehensive evidence base to be able to demonstrate that. Um, it is part of the work that we'll be carrying out as part of iDeploy um, in, in, in the future, but there's nothing yet that we've identified that, that should be a gatekeeper, if you like. Um, clearly, um, um, compressors come in very different shapes and sizes, so um, you would need to do a full technical review, um, which we will be in the future. But so far, no issues. I would just add to that that the the gas distribution networks are, um, with our experiences with with green gases to date, um, generally they have to connect where there's spare capacity on the network at the moment. So we're looking at how we can be more flexible to to make capacity where it's needed in an economic way. And one way to do that is to install compressors around the network and start moving the gas around. Um, uh, and managing those flows to create that capacity. And as we, if we start to do that, and that's still a debate with uh, uh, that we'll need to have with the industry and with Ofgem in terms of the pricing arrangements and and funding. Um, but we'll have to make sure that the spec for those new bits of kit are robust to to future outcomes. Um, and also consider things like shrinkage as well, so leakage. leakage. So uh, need to make sure those those new compressors do not contribute any more to to greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we've maybe got time for just one more question quickly. Um, I'll pick up a couple that I think are probably related. So uh, Tom Johnson at RWE asks, um, what safety case or regulation changes are required to enable 20% blend uh, onto the networks? And I think there's a similar sort of question, I think, um, we are not 100% sure, but um, from, from Rob who asks, would you advise a buffering system on the front end of blend infrastructure to provide a boundary to the blend limits at the point of injection. So I think these are questions about the sort of safety case at the point of injection. So um, the the safety case of blending is really the core question of high deploy. Um, um, the evidence that we've presented to the HC so far has has led to the granting of the first exemption to um, the gas safety management regulations schedule three with the hydrogen limit that we spoke about or that was mentioned earlier. Um, effectively, it is that mechanism that will provide the regulatory approval for blending. So um, through engagement with the HC and presenting a generic case for blending that evidences um, the blend being as safe as natural gas through the use of a quantified risk assessment. 
um, yeah, that, that is what the Hi the Boy program is there to deliver. Um, so in terms of regulation changes, we, we aren't seeking changes to regulations, but to follow the follow in the footsteps of biomethane to, to achieve a class exemption process that then allows blending to take place. So currently biomethane um, injects under a 1% class exemption um, um, sort of assessment for the oxygen limit. We are proposing a similar process for hydrogen blending. Um, but the safety case is only one part of the regulations that need to be looked at. Billing is really where the biggest issues lie from a commercial and regulatory perspective, primarily to do with the flow weighted average calculation um, and the um, thermal mass regulations. Um, we are hoping that there shouldn't need to be any formal regulation change, but there should be a technical solution that, that allows to work within the wording of the regulations. Um, but that is something that we need to confirm more formally before embarking down any particular technical route. Um, and just to pick up on the final question around buffer tank, that's really around seasonal storage. Um, you know, do you need storage effectively is the question, um, um, which which I think we are, which I think and, um, Angie answered earlier. Okay. Um, thank you, Tommy. Thank you, uh, Angie, Zoe, and Stuart, um, for your contributions. Um, I think. Um, we should um, move over to the second panel. So Stuart, I'll ask you to stay on. Um, and uh, Zoe, Angie and Tommy, thanks, thanks again. Thank uh, you. Cheers, bye-bye. Uh, and if I could ask um, the Frontier team to return to the stage. Um, so hi, Aurora and Lucy, and we're also joined by Dan Roberts, who was um, one of the directors um, on this project. So I think um, we're obviously going to focus now on the, on the questions that are more sort of uh, directly related to the, uh, the to the frontier study and to the commercial framework um, for, for, for blending that we presented. Um, so try to um, distinguish those from amongst the questions that we have. Um, so I think um, first question, maybe there's a, there's a sort of group of questions that are around um, the link between um, what we've talked about in our study and the, um, the kind of policy support or the policy framework that might exist um, for hydrogen. So, so Mark Schofield asked a few questions around uh, green, blue, grey pricing um, or differentiating between, um, between those. Um, and I think there's a question from John Baldwin similarly um, around sort of green hydrogen at present electricity being used for electrolysis pays renewable surcharges and it's not economic. So electrolysis for hydrogen should be exempt from these charges. So I, I wonder, Lucy, if you might want to talk briefly about that. Yeah, sure. Um, I think th those are all very good questions. Um, the funding arrangements are clearly very important uh, to get hydrogen into the grid. This this was outside um, the scope of our work, so we don't use um, the study to identify what the charging, what, what the funding arrangements need to be. So our study was mainly focused on the impact of connection and operation of hydrogen facilities, rather than how to incentivize and can fund hydrogen deployment itself. Um, there is clearly an interaction between the um, production incentives and the commercial arrangements. So for, for example, the cost of curtailing hydrogen production will be influenced by the design of the, of the subsidy arrangements. Uh, but given that the form of hydrogen support um, and when it will be introduced, if it does, it's, it's at the moment very uncertain. We haven't um, attempted in our report to evaluate all the plausible combinations of government support and commercial arrangements um, in, in our report. We've identified that element as an action for Ofgem and the networks to consider further once more is known about the policy support uh, mechanism. Um, I think having said that, uh, we do not expect the interactions between the policy framework 
and the commercial arrangement to be significant under the, um, the baseline circumstances. And there are two reasons for that. Um, the first one is because our baseline circumstances effectively assume that the blending constraint cap is enriched very often. So there are less interactions between the form of support and the risk and cost of curtailment from that perspective. And, and the other reason is because you would expect that the support mechanism for early producers would be more tailored. Um, so um, effectively ensuring that the choices made by those producers work in harmony with the commercial framework. Okay, thanks, Lucy. Anyone else want to add anything on that? Or? Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. I think this one got, um, again, quite a few upvotes. It's from uh, Mohammed Khalif, who asks, um, do, you think, uh, do you think there are any changes that will need to be made to wholesale gas market arrangements in a 20% blend world? And if not, uh, why? Um, so Dan, can I hand to you for that one first? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so um, I think it's important to say that one of the one of the input um, sort of assumptions for our um, study was indeed that um, the NBP trading arrangements as they stand um, remain. Um, and as, as part of the study, we uh, we looked at that and concluded that that should be um, possible uh, in the way you in the way you address blending. So if, for example, you, you, you assume that there remains one contract, one uh, if you like, standard commodity that people are buying and selling, which is MBP gas. Um, all customers, all shippers are buying the amount of the, the megawatt hours of energy that they need of MBP gas to, to service their loads. Now, that's a mixture of hydrogen and methane, and clearly the volume of that um, gas per megawatt hour is going to change as the blend limit changes but fundamentally you've got a set of customers downstream who are buying megawatt hours of a gaseous substance and suppliers upstream be they methane or hydrogen um, producers who are supplying megawatt hours of a gaseous um, substance and they're getting the same price for that now for the methane producers that that then, and, and for the and for the customers, that then is once you've sorted the billing issues out, there's no further sort of questions to be answered. The the the, the, the remaining question is: Well, the hydrogen producers, we know um, low carbon hydrogen is more expensive than um, than methane to produce, and that's obviously where the interaction with the government support comes in. So effectively, um, the subsidy contract, the subsidy arrangements would need to top up. Um, the per megawatt hour payment that the hydrogen producers were getting um, to, to ensure that their projects were economic. But if you construct the arrangement like that, um, you can effectively secure um, these levels of blending without major upheaval or change to the, uh, to the, to the wholesale, to the MVP trading arrangements. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan. Um, I going to move to a question from uh, Rodney Brook, um, who has asked um, about the access to capacity for successive hydrogen uh, connections. So he's asked, is there anything to learn from the challenges experienced by renewable generators seeking connection um, to electricity networks? Um, Dan or Aurora, I don't know. Is that, is that you, I, Dan? I can... I can I can give a I can give a start of an answer to that certainly. So I mean, well, I guess in what we've proposed, we've tried actually to draw on um, experiences as has already been said from biomethane um, connections and um, and producers and the, the 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 lessons that have been learned from um, from that process to draw on lessons from. Um, renewable electricity generation, but also to draw on lessons from um, embedded generation and electricity more generally, where um, clearly connections and network pricing have been a major um, a major question. And I guess it, it, you could maybe distill what we've thought about into 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 sort of three um, three maxims or three three principles. So the first is something around transparency and predictability, so that investors know. Um, what they're getting into so that they can, if you like, see the path by which um, arrangements are going to evolve over time. And I guess you know, when we talk about the preference 
for um, shallow versus deep connections, where deep connections, you, you know, you're always going to have questions about, well, what happens when someone connects after me and how does that arrangement work? That's part and parcel of that sort of making sure that investors have a, have a, have a more certain um, basis on which to invest. And equally, sort of being clear around um, the system operation arrangements and the, the impact assessment and the, the potential for curtailment um, that we've talked about so that investors can um, can understand the likely direction of travel of those arrangements and um, plot what that means for where would be um, good points on the network to connect um, in knowledge of the fact that that's going to be the sort of arrangement. Second um, principle sort of already again already been talked about standardization so um, whilst the the initial hydrogen producers connecting will in in some sense be sort of they will be subject to probably more bespoke arrangements and if you like there will be a little there will be a, little, a bit of learning by doing in that process the aim to go relatively rapidly onto a set of standardized arrangements so again investors have um, a degree more certainty as to what they are um, they can expect and I guess thirdly um, you know, an objective from the outset of trying to ensure economic efficiency and to avoid distortions, and that's, I guess, what comes, what, what's driven a little bit our, our suggestions of, um, on the distribution side of things, the changes to the um, the entry charges and harmonisation of arrangements across transmission and distribution, so that if you like, there aren't very obvious distortion potentials from the outset, which then you know, someone comes along and, and has to change things um, mid-flight. So I guess we've we've tried to learn those lessons from um, from from past processes, um, happy and painful both. Um, and you know, inevitably there will be more. But if you like, we've tried at the outset to to bake those into some of the proposals we've made. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a related question again from from Rodney Brook that's that are that is around you know when you're when you're thinking about those sort of cost reflective charging principles do, do you include an assessment of c customer response to the signaling so he's asking if that would it avoid unnecessary complexity i don't know if you want to say something about that dan i i guess well to the extent that we have um where we thought it was sort of kind of proportionate which is principally in relation to some of the connections proposals and the the, the distribution entry charge um we've sort of said there should be whether whether it looks like there is the potential for there to be um, differential costs caused by production entering to the system in different locations or at different times. We've suggested that there are charges, the LRMC based charges at distribution, um, to signal that on the anticipation that producers will then react and um, locate in ways and inject in ways which are um, beneficial for the network as a whole. So I guess part and parcel of the assumptions behind particularly the efficiency aspects of um, of our proposals are that you will get that sort of um, response from from producers in exactly the same way that hopefully they'll respond to the, the, the proposals around system operation and see the potential for curtailment in already, if you like, hydrogen congested areas, if you put it like that, and and look for, for opportunities to connect on the network in, um, in other places. Can I, okay. Mark, oh, sorry, Stuart, yeah. Yeah, can I just add to that? So I've I've got a background um, in previous roles in electricity. So I've done electricity, I've managed electricity queues, I've done electricity network pricing. Um, so I'm familiar with with a lot of the issues. And again, one of the reasons why we wanted to start this this process early is to put in place a framework that isn't just dealing with the first few, but starts the thinking early about how how we can manage larger scale rollout as well. Um, I, don't, I just don't think that happened in electricity. It was, it was, it evolved. Um, people thought it was, it was small, it was insignificant, and then uh, exaggeration. I know, but sort of woke up one morning. There are thousands of, of megawatts of, of, of embedded generation across the country, and it's driving everything. So, and then the market has to, and the rules have to change to to uh, to rebalance um, the commercial arrangement. So, I'm very very keen that we put something in place that isn't just looking on day one, day one, or the first five years but has a has a clear roadmap of how we're going to do this on an enduring basis whether it's one or whether it's a thousand of these okay um thanks Stuart. and um, i'm gonna i think we've got time for at least one more question maybe two so i'm gonna move to a question we got from uh, doug wood 
um, at EFET, who asked um, what flexibility in the ratio of hydrogen to methane is currently manageable by consumers and would there need to be balancing assets or markets in both products to keep that ratio constant? Um, or can methane be reduced when more H2 is available and vice versa? So uh, Aurora, I don't know if you want to maybe have a first answer of that one. Yeah, sure. So I think this comes back to the issue um, that we spoke about around managing industrial user requirements. So hydrogen blend impacts elements of gas quality. So one, one issue that came up quite a lot was impacts on the Wobby index. Uh, which measure, measures the energy content of gas and obviously the more hydrogen uh, that's injected uh, the more that's impacted um, so large or frequent fluctuations uh, in the wobby index can impact uh, industrial user equipment and processes in the near term we think that uh, that can be managed under our recommended solution where um, there are restrictions around the gas that uh, producers can inject into the grid Further out in the future where potentially the baseline circumstances might not apply, uh, the SO may need to take a more active role in managing those impacts. So, for example, through locational trading, um, potentially uh, asking certain producers to turn down when they're having too much of an impact. Um, there's also alternative solutions where uh, the users themselves would be responsible. So, for example, they could, uh, they could install de-blending equipment. Um, where, where they actually manage the blend themselves. Um, so I, I think in the near term, the solution is um, fairly straightforward, but obviously things could get more complex as, as uh, the market evolves. And I think that just needs to be kept under review and different options considered and uh, assessed as things progress. Okay, um, thank you, Aurora. Um, I've, I've seen there's a question that got quite a few votes that I think um, maybe we should turn to from Stephen O'Rourden who asks, um, how do you envisage guarantees of origin for hydrogen working within this framework? Um, Dan? Um, yep, I can give a go at that one. So first thing to say um, is that that wasn't part of the uh, wasn't part of the scope of um, of what we uh, looked at as part of the study. But I think it can fit reasonably well into the framework. So um, you know you would expect um, the renewable um, or the low carbon hydrogen producers um, to so to qualify for um, guarantees of origin or some some sort of uh, if I uh, if I if I unfortunately use the word Brexit uh, some sort of successor scheme if uh, if we're not part of the European uh, guarantees of origin um, arrangements um, and as they would receive those um, those certificates on having produced their um, their product, taking into account, you know, the, the carbon intensity potentially of its um, of its manufacture, um, they would then be able to sell those in exactly the same way to monetize, if you like, the um, the greenness um, in addition to any subsidy scheme, um, just as in the as in the same way as a, a renewable uh, electricity provider um, would be able to. Um, and I guess it's part of a broader question, which is actually something we. We tackled in our in our work for FET and our recent work for for GLE. Um, you know, the hydrogen potentially is going to be uh, produced and imported from lots of um, weird and wonderful parts of the world, um, and there is there is going to need to be more more generally, I guess, some form of um, certification of the the means of production and the the level of carbon content of that production of all sorts of different hydrogen. Um, and so, uh, whilst we think I, I think goose would work um, relatively effectively within this framework as um, as they have in 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 the power market, I think you know there's there are there are broader questions, particularly on international trade around um, certification, which um, which will uh, will have to be answered. Okay, thank you, Dan. I think um, that's um, as much time as we have for question and answers. So um, th thanks again um, to you all on this panel and to the previous panel. Thank you to everyone um, who's dialed into this. As I say, we're really pleased to see the amount of engagement we've got in this. Um, and, um, you know, as Stuart mentioned, you know, this is sort of seen as a, a, as a sort of a real um, solid attempt to sort of kick off this, this discussion with a set of clear proposals. 
So we, we welcome further engagement, discussion, um, names of people to contact are on the, the front of the report. Um, and uh, I'll just give a last quick plug to the, the second webinar that's going to happen next week, which is going to cover all the same ground just for people who can attend today. Um, so thank you again, and um, we'll see you all soon.